let's now try an example of calculating the uh, potential for given charge distribution. This is going to be a classic example that we're going to be using throughout this course. Uh, this would be the example of the voltage associated with a constant electric field. Voltage for a constant electric field. The classic example of what would create such a field is this capacitor arrangement of charges that we've already been seeing in our exercises. So just to remind ourselves how this thing goes, what we're going to have is we're going to have some infinite sheet of charge or sheet that we can approximate as infinite. And there will be some constant charge per unit area, positive sigma. We'll take the uh, top sheet to be positive. Then down below it at a distance L, there's going to be another sheet of charge, which has the complementary charge, the same value of charge per unit area, but now it's going to be a negative sigma. And I'm going to take these two uh, sheets of charge to be separated from one another by a distance, which I will call L. And the question then is going to ask if I consider the bottom sheet to be location A and the top sheet to be location B. The question is going to be then, what is the potential, uh, the voltage, I'm sorry, as we go to sheet B coming from sheet A for this particular situation. If you want again to think about our, our famous uh, voltmeter, what we would be saying is we're going to take a voltmeter, right? We're going to take the negative or ground lead to be at the uh, originating location, which in this case is A. So that wire has to get hooked up to A. And then there's going to be the positive lead, right? That is the lead that always we use to take us to um, the final point. In this case, that's we're looking for where point uh, the final destination will be point B. So we wire the positive lead plus, right? And we'll take that wire and hook it up to point B. And we're asking now then, what will this particular voltmeter read under these particular circumstances? Now. To answer that question, of course, we're going to need to know something then about the electric field between the sheets because one of the best ways, of course, to get that voltage is to know about the electric field. Now, we've actually uh, calculated this electric field in the past. So let me uh, redraw the situation uh, from a, a front-on view that will make our analysis a le little easier to carry out. And then we'll go ahead and calculate that particular voltage. So here, if we take a uh, front view instead of the 3D view, if we take a front view and look edge on then at these particular sheets. In our front view, the sheets will just look like a straight line as we're looking you know, directly down uh, from, the, from, from over here, right? We're trying to look from over here at what the situation looks like. So that means we're going to have you know, positive charges on this top sheet at their charge density sigma and down below. There's going to be negative charges evenly distributed on the sheet with, the, with charge distribution minus sigma. We've previously worked out the electric field. Notice that as we go from point A here to point B, we're always moving here in between our sheets. So I could uh, call this, for instance, point A and this one point B. And because we're only interested in what goes on in the path from A to B, as we're going here uh, between the sheets, we only really need to know about the electric field in between there. Now, in between, we know if we think about the electric field, each sheet, of course, gives us a constant dis, uh, value for the electric field, which is independent of distance from the corresponding sheet. The top sheet at any given point will produce a downward electric field, right? You think of your point as a positive test charge. The negative sheet will also produce a uh, downward electric field because if this is a positive test charge, just like it's repelled from the top sheet, it's attracted by the minus sheet. But in both cases, the net effect is a downward effect. So the two effects add, and we get some total electric field that always points downward here 
between these two sheets in a direction as I've indicated to you here. We'd also showed, uh, for instance, that if you're outside these two sheets, the electric field will be zero. The reason is, for instance, if you're down here, you will be attracted by the negative sheet, which would then make an upward electric field, but your positive test charge would be repelled by the positive sheet up here, so then you would have cancellation. The same thing works for the above case. So we have some constant electric field here in between the sheets, and it's twice because we have contributions uh, equal can, um, summing contributions from each sheet. It's twice what you would expect from a single sheet. So it's two times sigma over uh, two epsilon naught. That is the formula for one sheet. That would be for one sheet. And so our final result then has the twos canceling and we just have sigma on epsilon naught as our constant electric field. Very good. Now that we know the electric field, we're in a position then to uh, calculate the potential, the voltage. So the voltage then in going to B from A, just copying down our definition, is minus, because it's the work done by us, because it's going to become potential energy, work we can get out later, integrating then from the starting point A to the final point B, whatever our electric field is dotted with our displacement. And now to evaluate this, we uh, can go ahead and use our basic facts that we know about dot products. So let's break this down here a little bit. This then will become the magnitude of the electric field vector, which is something that we know. We just gave a formula for it up here. We then have the magnitude of the uh, dx vector. And then we are going to have the cosine of the angle between them. Now for this cosine, we always have to be very careful about this so that we get our signs correct. To, in order to determine that, we need to know what the angle is between our displacements dx and our electric field which requires us actually to know what our displacements are. We know the electric field is down, but if we think about our displacements, we are going from point A to point B. So we're going from here all the way up to here. If we divide our pathway into a series of steps, our steps would look something like this, right? Our delta x's or our dx's, as I had said, we should just start to think of these as little infinitesimal dx's. We don't have to call them delta, you know, capital delta x's like a mathematician might. Our little dx vectors you see are pointing straight up, whereas our electric field vectors are pointing straight downwards. So when we think about this angle, remember the way we determine the angle is we draw both vectors with their base at the same point. And in this case, the dx vector points straight up the uh, electric field vector points straight down for uh, each of our points as we move along here. Now I see my dx vector didn't come out particularly straight up looking. Let me try to fix him a little bit better for us here. Good. And the angle theta then here is the angle between these two. And the angle between these two vectors is a very wide angle, right? That's 180 degrees. So what has to go between uh, uh, the what has to go in for theta then is this 180 degree angle between my two vectors, and we have to be careful about that when we evaluate the final quantity. The cosine of theta then we can replace, knowing that the cosine of 180 degrees is actually equal to minus one. So that's how we're going to take care of the cosine factor. We still have the uh, magnitude of the electric field. For that, I will just write E, um, just like I've tried to indicate to you up here. And we know the value of the magnitude of that field is sigma divided by epsilon naught. dx, of course, we can replace just with our displacement vector, the length of our little displacement vector, dx. So then, Packing all of this together, you see I have these three factors here I have to be very careful about that this cosine was a minus one. 
tidying things up, I've got then minus the integral from a to b of this constant value for e, which is just sigma and epsilon naught, times dx, it's not a dot product anymore, but there's this extra minus sign here. There's a minus one from my cosine, so there's an extra factor of minus one. You'll notice, though, that the minuses cancel out very nicely. So then what I'm left with is the integral from a to b of e dx. The electric field e, as we've been saying, is some nice constant value, so I can always pull that out of my integral. And that will just give me the electric field E times the integral from A to B dx. And that integral, very nicely we know then, is just the sum of the lengths of the little vectors here along my path. But the distance from the bottom plane to the top plane, as we had in our original diagram, is just L. So here, let me label that to remind ourselves. But since that is just L, this length here down below is just L. Touch back up my B here. Good. So the answer then is just my value for the electric field times L. And the final answer would be, if we want it all in terms of the given quantities, would be uh, the electric field is sigma on epsilon naught. So my final answer would be, in this case, sigma over epsilon naught times L would be the voltage between A and B. So you could put a box, nice box around that, that result. Okay, so we have the voltage then for this particular uh, capacitor type arrangement of charges. There were though a couple of very important lessons I'd like to draw out of this whole little uh, example exercise that we've worked through very carefully. So our key lessons are then as follows. The first one has to do with this very special case when the electric field is constant. So the first lesson says that if E, the magnitude of the electric field, right, is constant, then in that case, the potential difference V is always equal to just the electric field times the distance that you've traveled, which I would call L. That's a very handy formula. Right away from this, you can s learn something about the uh, units on electric field. If you want to think about it, the electric field then would equal, in such a case, the voltage divided by the length. That is why the units on electric field are sometimes quoted to you as volts per meter. But this is going to be a very useful formula we're going to use in a moment coming up. So just try to keep that in mind in your memory banks. The second key lesson to draw from this whole analysis has to do with the signs of the electric field. I want you to notice that the potential, right, I mean the voltage to go to B from A is positive, right? We got a nice positive result out here, but that positive result that we got came down to the way these minus signs had lined up. And if you think about what was responsible for those, we got a net positive sign because the electric field and the dx vectors were in opposite directions. So if you're moving here against the electric field, upstream, if you will, in our little fluid model, but against the electric field, that's when you're going to get a positive voltage. Since the voltage is positive if uh, you, if, if we're moving against the electric field, or if you want a term for that, you could think of that as moving upstream. Okay, so we've learned now two key lessons about the sign of the voltage and a nice simple formula for voltage under simple conditions. Now I think we're all ready and prepared to start to look at what uh, happens as current begins to flow and we can start to build up a circuit.